I have a, a little bit lengthy question. I hope you don't mind. Um, who's we? You mean in the title of my book? Or no, generally? in the talk you said we have to do this and we have to do that. Who's we? This is a question that's been around for a long time. As uh, you know, uh, in, in old-fashioned terms, you were looking for the um, agent that will change the world. We're looking for the force that will change the world. No, well, the we that we uh, should be looking towards these days is not the we of 50 years ago or 100 years ago. Clearly, wage labor is a big part of this we. People who work for their wages, people who are employed by others on the basis of wages, and they've got their own, own forms of organization, their trade unions, and whatever other institutions they have. We start there, as we we'll, always we'll do in a capitalist country. Wage labor is key, but it isn't just wage labor today, because finance has uh, grown and penetrated so many areas. Uh, of economic and social life, we need broader alliances. Wage labor must look towards uh, parts of society that rely on small and medium businesses which have actually been crushed by this. And they're looking for um, new ways out. We're looking, they're looking for a way to survive. In other parts of the world, not in the United States, but in other parts of the world, um, wage labor and small and medium businesses can look towards parts of agriculture because there are large agrarian um, classes that are, have been ruined by this uh, contemporary capitalism. I mean, part of what I have in mind with the question is that most of the conversations about what to do about finance, what to do about banking, in fact, most of the conversations that take place in the media and academia, it's all really asking the existing power structure to make changes. No. Like, Financial reform needs to somehow come out of the, the existing Congress and the existing parties. And, 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 and a lot of the economists I wind up interviewing <coughs> on The Real News, uh, less so now, but too much so in the past, I think, we're less talking to ordinary people about what they're going to have to do to change things, and we're more talking to the political elite. Financial reform, I think, is one of the best examples of it, which is you would have all kinds of suggestions on how to regulate banking, and, but the truth of it is you couldn't pass even the most measly regulation. Uh, even on, like, they tried to pass position limits about how much, how much of, of any one thing you could own in the commodities future trading exchange. And, and, and that became such Swiss cheese, weak need stuff that finally made it out of the commission, and then it was even overturned in the federal court. They couldn't even get that stuff passed. Um, I asked Ralph Nader a while ago whether some of the reforms he was capable of lobbying for and successfully winning anywhere from seatbelts to the EPA and other very important pieces of legislation. He didn't think any of that could be done now. So uh, when I mean who's we, I mean, you know, uh, you know is this political elite yeah. capable of reforming the financial sector? I see. Uh, I, I immediately and automatically think that Ordinary people should do it, which is why I answer the way. I, mean, I take it for granted, uh, and I take it as read, that if you rely on the elite, um, you're not going to get very far. And the reason you're not going to get very far is that the people who've got uh, uh, a vested interest in financialization, the people who, make, uh, who earn profits and big salaries out of finance uh, in one way or another, have also effected policy capture. Basically, there's no, it's very clear in this country and elsewhere through financial means, uh, through presence in uh, Washington, D.C., and so on, uh, the influence of these uh, layers of uh, the economy on the policymaking process is enormous uh, in, in obvious and less obvious ways. And this kind of speaks to the same thing, because a lot of people suggest, you know, if only Glass-Steagall no. would come back. Glass-Steagall, how many people know what Glass-Steagall is? About half? Uh, why don't you quickly tell people what Glass-Steagall was, and then we'll Gla talk about glass -Steagall it. is a regulation that was passed in the interwar years, which basically prevented um, uh, large uh, commercial banks from engaging in investment banking activity. In other words, from using people's deposits to play games in the financial markets, stock markets, uh, and so on, and make profits in that way. This was, this was. Um, um, Abol abolished not so long ago. And that under, was under Clinton. Under Clinton, yes. And that was 
but, but, but actually the process and the, and the trend started before that. Yeah, sure. uh, and so basically this, is, this was part of the financialization process that I mentioned. That's exactly what financialization of banks uh, was all about. Banks were then able to engage in um, activities in financial markets and making profits out of these uh, derivatives and so on and making fees and commissions rather than plain vanilla lending. So some people have made a, the argument if only Glass-Steagall could come back, if only there was better regulation, uh, you know, that, that, that it's policy changes that created the opportunity for this finance sector yeah. to become what it is. I mean, like I said and I stressed, regulation and re-regulation is very important. But to me, financialization is something that is deeply rooted in the way that I've, I've discussed. Uh, the, the, the deregulation of finance has helped, and he has made it possible, and he, he has probably speeded it up, if you could measure these things. But that's not where it comes from. That, it, it doesn't come from a sudden change of heart or a sudden change of mind among policymakers, which then allows uh, finance to do all these uh, terrible things. It, it, it comes from uh, slow structural changes, such as the ones that I've discussed, in the realm of the non-financial enterprises, and then banks and so on. That's why, that's why confronting it is not simply a matter of passing uh, laws that will re-regulate finance, even if you could do that, bearing in mind the policy capture that I mentioned. Mm. It's actually uh, a lot deeper than that, which is why you need to rely on ordinary people. You need to rely on alliances, political and social alliances, of people who are affected by this, whose lives are basically ruined. Uh, by these processes and who want a better solution and a better uh, and a better outcome. Any questions? Over there. <laughs> what does that what does the alternative look like? Well, in terms of the populace, um, you know, we are not very organized. You know, you look in uh, like Mexico or someplace like that and there's something that the government does or whatever, and people take to the streets. We take to our iPads, and it doesn't, you know, so what is this kind of mobilization of the people, the labor, uh, the labor markets, the small businesses, medium businesses, what does that process look like to change, um, to change the big business, to change the banking institutions, and even their own, uh, you know, the household uh, dynamics? In some ways, I would expect you to, 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 to inform me and teach me about this, because each country, each country has its own particularities uh, and specificities. It has its own history, its own institutions, its own traditions. The U.S. Uh, working class and the U.S. Uh, people have got uh, their own traditions in this, and the traditions are violent and you know, <laughs> acute struggle with these things. So they're not the same as... Uh, countries in Europe and so on. But the, 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 broad, the broad parameters, uh, they seem to be um, applicable here in this country uh, as in others. There is no magic bullet. There is no easy trick. To some extent, it's a, it's a slow process of uh, organizing things like this and broader networks uh, such as this and giving people the confidence of standing up for their rights, explaining to them what is actually going on, not believing the stuff that's coming from the mass media uh, and so on, beginning to challenge this uh, uh, and give people the knowledge they need, and then gradually uh, helping them to begin to organize at the level of the neighborhood, at the level of the workplace, um, in order to, be, to, to take on the pressures and, 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 and problems that come up uh, at that uh, micro level. If you're good at that, and if you begin to create the networks you need, then you give it a political dimension, and you begin to take on the system on a, on a bigger level, too. I mean, I, I think it's, it's not really what we can talk about tonight, because it's like it's really its whole subject. But probably sort of the, some of the things you're seeing in Latin America are closer to what it might look like, uh, where you start having, you could say, progressive takeovers of certain cities. And eventually, like in Brazil, you had some cities before you had a national government. Uh, the, uh, you know, in all, you know, it's going to be, there's no reason to think it isn't going to be some kind of electoral form uh, as long as there's still elections. And, and there's no tradition here of not having elections, even if there is a tradition of rigging them. 
Um, but probably it starts at the level of cities, is my guess, and that's part of the reason we're here. Um, what we're trying to grapple with now, because I don't think much can happen unless you have a plan, unless there's a vision. Like, what would you do if you took control of Baltimore? It's easy to say what's wrong, but if you actually had to grapple with the problems of a, of a big city, and you, know, you almost have to include the state, because the state would take over the city if the city pushed too far ahead of where the state was. Um, I mean, I, we want to have a lot of conversations at that level, um, but right now we want to talk more, I, I think tonight's more about what, if you, like so I said at the beginning, let's say you already controlled the city and the state. What would, what would that financial model look like? And, and that, I think there's things in common with what's being talked about in Europe. Uh, I mean, Kostas is very involved in Greece, and they may have a fairly progressive party in power in the next few months. They have to, he's involved with them, and they may have to actually answer this question if Syriza, which is one of the you know, left-wing party in Greece, if they get elected, and they might well, and they're going to walk into a, excuse the language, they're going to walk into a shitstorm of an economy, um, what are they going to do? So. This, it's very real. Like it's, we don't want to talk about what would be the perfect model in the sky if you could do anything you wanted. What would be the most lovely social economic system? We're talking about what could you do in knowing that what you're going to do is going to be a fight. You, like for example, you want to turn boarded up housing into, I mean the city is one of the biggest landlords in the city. Why isn't the city turning boarded up housing, boarded up housing into low income housing? And we, one, we want to imagine a plan for that. On the other hand, you're going to be in a war with real estate speculators because they want to gentrify these neighborhoods. They want the last black families to get the hell out so that they can start making money out of these neighborhoods. So if you start with a municipal plan to actually bring people back into the communities and revive these communities with low-income houses under the roof of the city, well, number one, you're going to run into what's happened in uh, Richmond, California, where they've used eminent domain to stop foreclosures. And now the banks won't give mortgages to the people. And that's what would happen here. So now you've got to, in fact, I, my next question to you. So now let's imagine you're in this moment. You've got to find another way to finance mortgages for people because the banks are really pissed off at you that you just took all this housing that they, they thought could be knocked down and slowly gentrified. And now you're saying you want low-income families there and the banks don't want to loan anybody money to move into these houses. How do you start building an alternative financial system in, in today's real world if you control, say, the city, maybe the state? Yeah. <laughs> um, every country has got different problems, so, but related. It, it, for, so in the US, the banks are very, very careful about they burn their fingers, and they're not lending, basically. And that creates all kinds of problems. Uh, for housing. Now, how do you go um, about it? How do you go about um, dealing with that? Well, think about how the central bank has dealt with, the, with the, the problem so far. The central bank has basically intervened by providing the banks with massive liquidity under quantitative easing, so-called, in the hope that the banks would do wonderful things with this uh, finance. And whatever the bank's done, they made it available to, the, available to their friends in the financial system. So you've ended up with another bubble effectively emerging in Wall Street. And you've ended up with a lot of um, capital flowing out of the country and going into developing countries and creating financial growth there too. And now, if it comes back, it's going to leave disaster behind it. Well, the central bank didn't have to intervene in that way. It didn't, it didn't have to follow that policy. Obviously, he had to do something, but he could have targeted its interventions. He could have regulated credit and where it went, and he could have um, he could have regulated this price. So we need to think of ways in which the price and the quantity of credit um, can be set, can be regulated. We don't need free markets in the provision of credit, free markets in in the price of credit. You think itself. that can be the level done at the level of a state? I think at the level of the state. I mean, I don't really know. I need to look at the. Um, the particulars. Not perhaps asking you questions that aren't fair because it's yeah. a real American uh, question. I mean, yeah, right? I need to look at the particulars because mm. finance varies from place to place and has a certain institutional uh, character in every place. But yeah, there are regulations that you can begin to, to, to introduce and 
real effects that you can have on the activities of financial institutions, even at the micro level. Mm. Uh, now, how possible that would be in Maryland or somewhere else, I don't know. Um, but well, you could do something where the but, city but in principle rallies could, the, the abilities yes. of the credit union. So, so both at the level, say, of the central bank, it's clear what happened there, um, and at the level of um, other institutional uh, operators, you could intervene in the realm of finance and target what credit is doing, rather than give to these private financiers public support and hope that they will do the best uh, for the people. They don't. They don't. They just make profits as best they can, and mm. uh, you know, good luck to you, basically. Yeah.